day and having patience and being here. I want to thank Steve King for the wonderful uh, opportunity to, to join you today uh, because I think this has been a fantastic event and uh, you've heard from a lot of uh, fascinating speakers. Uh, I'd like to turn the discussion a little bit to uh, national security. I just want to assure you at the beginning I'm acutely aware that Thad McCotter and I are the only thing standing between you and a well-deserved reception and dinner. Uh, but this is a, uh, the, the subject of national security is one that's absolutely critical as we look toward uh, 2012. Uh, the, the political com commentarian likes to say that American voters don't really care about foreign policy, they don't see how it affects their lives. Uh, obviously it has direct, tangible impact uh, on our independence, on our freedom, on peace and security. Uh, the independence we need to preserve our constitution and our sovereignty, freedom against foreign economic domination, and peace and security through uh, protecting ourselves against international terrorism, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and other foreign threats. This is a uh, concrete interest to the people of America, I believe. <coughs> it's true that foreign policy uh, and national security unfold differently than uh, domestic policies and debates, that the things don't wait on our schedule, uh, as the crises in the Middle East and Japan today, I think, show uh, very dramatically. It's like uh, Humphrey Bogart said in Casablanca, it seems that fate has taken a hand, and indeed it has, uh, showing the problems we have with our leadership in the White House. You know, on January the 20th, 2009, when it came to national security matters, when President Obama took the oath of office, he was not qualified to be President of the United States. Yeah. Today, today, more than two years later, he's still not qualified to be President of the United States. And this, this reflects a crisis in American international leadership. Now we ask ourselves, why does the President uh, perform this way, and I think there are a couple of reasons. First, he just doesn't care very much about national security. It's not what gets him up in the morning. It's not what motivates him. And it makes him the first president, Republican or Democrat, since Franklin Roosevelt woke up on December the 7th, 1941, not to put national security at the top of his agenda. Number two, uh, he doesn't see the rest of the world as terribly threatening. We can see this going back to what he said in the 2008 campaign. He didn't want to talk about the global war on terrorism. He didn't want to talk about the threats that we faced. He called Iran a tiny country, uh, as if a tiny country with a few nuclear weapons can't ruin your day. <laughs> he feels comfortable uh, with the notion of America in decline, of America not taking the leading role protect its own interests. Uh, and this does mark him as a very a different kind of president. Now, in days uh, gone by, a president with those characteristics might have become an isolationist, but not this president. He is the fullest uh, example of multilateralism in operation, and we can see it today in the way he's handling uh, the crisis in uh, Libya. This is uh, a, a, an attitude that very gravely, uh, I think, threatens American sovereignty over the long term. Now, sovereignty uh, is a concept people debate over. A lot of people think it's kind of abstract. In the United States, we understand exactly what sovereignty is. It's not an abstraction. Sovereignty in America is held by us, by the people. That's what our Constitution says in its first three words. We, the people, we are sovereign here. So in you hear suggestions that we share sovereignty or cede sovereignty to international organizations. That's a way of saying, you know, you have too much control over your own government. Uh, that, that is a truly remarkable statement, which I think everybody in this room rejects, but not Barack Obama. He's fascinated with international law. He talks about it all the time. On Monday, you're going to hear more about it. Uh, and it's something that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that doesn't receive the kind of attention I think that it should. A lot of it uh, set by academic law professors, get the connection, uh, who, who like to theorize about these things. Let me give you an example critical to America's ability to protect itself. In 1999, during the Kosovo crisis, the then Secretary General 
of the United Nations, Kofi Annan said the following, unless the Security Council is restored to its preeminent position as the sole source of legitimacy on the use of force, we are on a dangerous path to anarchy. Now, I'd like to hear our president say whether he agrees with the former UN Secretary General or not. I think legitimacy for the United States comes from itself. We don't need to ask anybody else when we defend our interests. No, if we're permitted to use the force. And all this talk of international law, we need a president who will say unequivocally that in secular matters, at least for Americans, there is no higher authority than the United States Constitution. Yeah. Our president seems to have trouble with this. I think that's because he is our first post-American president. Now, it's a carefully chosen phrase. I didn't say un-American. I didn't say anti-American. I said post-American. Because, you know, he, he's beyond all that, that patriotism stuff. He, he's a citizen of the world. Uh, he doesn't believe in American exceptionalism. He doesn't uh, accept the unique role for America. Now, early in his administration, he was asked on his first trip to Europe, do you believe in American exceptionalism? And this is what he said. He said, yes, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as the Brits believe in British exceptionalism, and just as the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. Very carefully done. What he gave away, uh, what he gave in the first third of the sentence, he took back in the second two-thirds. There are 192 countries in the UN. He could have continued, just as the Papua New Guineans believe in Papua New Guinean exceptionalism, just as the Burkino Fasians believe in Burkino Fasian exceptionalism, just as the Trinidad and Tobagoans believe in Trinidad and Tobagoan exceptionalism. If everybody's exceptional, nobody's exceptional. And I think uh, that is very much uh, the Obama approach. This is not the first major leader in the Democratic Party to hold this view, but it's the first major leader to become president. Very similar to what uh, George H.W. Bush said in 1988 about his Democratic opponent that year, Governor Michael Dukakis. Uh, Bush 41 said then, uh, my opponent sees America as another pleasant country on the United Nations roll call somewhere between Albania and Zimbabwe. You would say the same thing about Barack Obama. Now, what should the Republican response be? Certainly it is not doing nothing in the international sphere. It is not isolationism. We have rejected that resoundingly in the past and we need to continue to do so. But neither is it succumbing to the Woodrow Wilsonian views of the President or others in our political debate. The answer is not multilateralism. Protection and security for the United States are not going to be found in the United Nations system. Nor is it an endless Wilsonian crusade to make the world <coughs> safe for democracy. Uh, when you look at the multilateralism and the idea of making the world safe for democracy, let's not forget Theodore Roosevelt's response to Wilson. Our Roosevelt said, first, we are to make the world safe for ourselves. And that is the policy that we should be pursuing. Uh, and on a subject I know is a sensitive one, I want to be very clear here that the way we do that is to pursue the policy of peace through strength. And that means sufficient budgetary expenditures for our military that no adversary dares to challenge us anywhere in the world. part of the government. <laughs> and we should find the waste and fraud and we should root it out unhesitatingly. But when we find it and correct it, we need to plow that money back into our defense expenditures. The Obama administration has already cut $300 billion from our defense baseline. And just a couple of months ago, the Secretary of Defense proposed $78 billion of more expenditures. 
If we have to keep that level of defense spending up, I am perfectly happy to find offsetting domestic programs that cut even more deeply than some have proposed. A dollar well spent on defense and intelligence matters is far more important than a dollar well spent on anything else in the federal government, period, close quote. run through some important issues that we're facing now. Uh, how about the war in Libya that our Nobel Peace Prize winning president announced last week? Uh, although, of course, it's not war. How could he keep that Nobel Peace Prize? It's only kinetic military action. Uh, this is the kind of, of verbal nonsense that, that uh, reveals the uh, utter lack of clarity in the president's thinking. Now, I believe unhesitatingly that the United States has a strategic interest in removing Omar Gaddafi from power. Uh, if we don't, there's every prospect he will return to international terrorism of the kind that brought down Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing 270 innocent people, including 189 innocent Americans, many of whom were on their way home for Christmas vacation in December of 88 when he did it. He would almost certainly also return to his pursuit of nuclear and chemical weapons. We cannot allow that to happen. But had we intervened early, promptly, and decisively, we could have tipped the balance of power to the opposition side early. This thing could be over by now. Uh, his inability to understand that, I think, risks uh, a long-term involvement with no clear conclusion. And for what reason? We still don't know what his objective is. Protecting innocent civilians? How can you protect innocent civilians when you're not prepared to use military force to remove the thing that's the greatest threat to the, to the innocent Libyan civilians, Muammar Gaddafi? And he said this past weekend in El Salvador, I think what he's really up to, listen to this, he said, uh, referring to uh, the international uh, coalition, he said, it means we have confidence we are not going in alone. And it is our military that is being volunteered by others to carry out missions that are important not only to us, but are important internationally. Our military is being volunteered by others. Who is the commander-in-chief here? Uh, a, a very good question. I think the answer here going forward uh, is to do what Ronald Reagan did in 1986. Our military has a wonderful euphemism called National Command Authority. It's a legitimate military target. In Libya, Muammar Gaddafi is National Command Authority. I think that's the answer right there. But, but while Libya certainly has our attention, there is chaos in the rest of our Middle East policy as well. The President had four different positions on Hosni Mubarak before Mubarak finally left. Uh, and the idea that we're on the uh, easy path to democracy in Egypt has already been refuted by events in just the past few days. But let's not lose sight of what the really critical issue is, and that is Iran's continued efforts to assert hegemony in the Middle East uh, in the conflict within Islam that goes back centuries, uh, and in the struggle for power over the oil-producing regions of the Persian Gulf. This is not an abstract strategic argument. If you've been to the gasoline station recently, you can see uh, already the forecast of what would happen if Iran got complete control over those oil-producing regions. A country that serves as the world's central banker of international terrorism, that is very, very close to achieving its 20-year-long objective of getting deliverable nuclear weapons. We have no policy on Iran. We can't even find ways to support the opposition forces uh, to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and the Islamic Revolution. That's why the conflict that we see now in Bahrain uh, is of enormous strategic importance to the United States. If Iran can get a pro-Iranian regime in that country, it can threaten Saudi Arabia, it can threaten our other Arab allies in the Gulf, uh, and our economy will be held in complete jeopardy at Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's discretion. Moreover, the instability in the Middle East threatens to undermine uh, the, the rock of stability we've sought for decades, which is peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors. There's every likelihood a new Egyptian government will revise the Camp David Accords, the government in Jordan could fall, and Israel's security 
will be threatened once again. You know, our forefathers, uh, when they came to this country, often referred to America as a city on a hill, quoting uh, scripture. Uh, and, and they referred to America as the New Jerusalem. Well, I think it's critical that the New Jerusalem not forget the Old Jerusalem when it comes under the <laughs> what we see today. And look at the other threats, the continuing threat of North Korea's nuclear weapons program, the increased belligerence of China, its territorial claims in the East and South China Sea that threaten the nations of Southeast Asia, its continued protection of North Korea and the nuclear weapons program there. Look at Russia and its increased assertiveness. You know, when he was still president, uh, Putin said that the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think most of us think that was a great way to end the 20th century. He obviously has a different point of view, and he's been pursuing that policy with great vigor, threatening our friends uh, in Western Europe with cutting off their oil and natural gas supplies. We've got only a few months, really, when you think about it, until the 2012 election. We need a sustained and unremitting discussion of the failures of the Obama administration to protect our national security and to remember why that is the president's primary responsibility. And let's remember, uh, as we look at that debate, what John Quincy Adams said so long ago, 1821, as Secretary of State, speaking of America and his view of our country. Wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will her heart, her benediction, and her prayers be. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom of independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Thank you very much. Thank you.